Rob will be glad to know that at least for today, we are following the church calendar and the lectionary. Today is Transfiguration Sunday, on which the lectionary tells us that we're, we are to read the passage from Matthew chapter 17 that we just read, and Psalm 99 that June read earlier. So we are following uh, the church calendar today. It's Transfiguration Sunday. The pyramids are now white and represented, repre representing Transfiguration Sunday, having just come through a long period of green pyramids, ordinary time. And now here, Ash Wednesday is on this coming Wednesday. We're into the Easter season, all of that. So I guess we ask the question, well, what's the meaning of the transfiguration? What's what are we to take from what we just read there in Matthew chapter 17, where Jesus goes up on the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and his face is transfigured, and Moses and Elijah end up being there, and the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, and then all of that disappears, and, and Jesus says, hey, don't say anything about this kind of thing. What are we to take from that? What, are we, what does this mean for us I think there's any number of things that we could look at or questions we could ask. Why was it Peter, James, and John that he brought up there? They were his closest disciples, of course, but why not any other disciples? Why was it Moses and Elijah, these Old Testament figures that appeared with him and not somebody else? Maybe Moses represented the law and Elijah the prophets and Jesus was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. You know, who knows? What about the voice from he heaven and you remember the voice from heaven at Jesus' baptism. They seem to correspond there. And why did Jesus tell them, hey, don't say anything about that? I don't know exactly all of that. But I do find one thing interesting because there's one other passage that the lectionary tells us to read that we've not yet read. It comes from 2 Peter chapter 1. It says this, for we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. So here's Peter writing. This, this writing says that it's written by Simon Peter and saying, hey, if you have doubts about who Jesus is, we were there. We were there. I saw it. I heard the voice. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty, right? Eyewitnesses obviously are an important thing if you're establishing anything in the world was there an eyewitness there and what is the testimony about the eyewitness were there other eyewitnesses and do their testimonies line up right and people will make a lot of this and and rightfully so that it validates who jesus was and is it validates the historical narrative to say that th we're getting this from eyewitnesses from people who were there and saw who jesus was and what Jesus did. And, and I think that's significant. It's good that people look into these things and wrestle through these things and, and talk about these things, study these things. But I also acknowledge that, I mean, we're reading this book that we have here, right, that is a copy of a version of the Bible that is a translation of manuscripts that we have, which were at least copies of other manuscripts that existed, which were probably copies of other manuscripts, which hopefully accurately reflected what Peter originally wrote, which we don't have. So we're trusting that the transmission of all these documents up to today, that what we have here in this book accurately reflects what Peter actually wrote. And then we're trusting that Peter was an eyewitness and then he accurately recorded what he saw and heard. That Peter is telling us the truth. That he's not trying to pull the wool over our eyes or, or invent a cleverly devised story, as he says. 
But he's trying to give it to us straight. He's just trying to report to us what he saw and heard. And again, I think it's good that people look into these things and study the manuscripts that we do have and try to recreate what happened and try to say, is it accurate? Can we trust it? All of that. And then I think it's something that people have to wrestle with. If you're going to read the scriptures and the story about Jesus and hear Peter says, I was an eyewitness of it. Well, that seems significant, right? So I think that's good. And But while I'm glad that people study those things, it's not something that I've studied extensively. And in a sense, it's, it's just not the thing that has been most important to me, even though I think all that these people do is helpful. That is, whether or not Peter is accurately recording what actually happened, whether or not what is recorded in here actually took place, that the person of Jesus is historical and is accurately record, recorded for us, that this actually happened, ah, it's just, it's, it's okay to me. It's not, it's, I'm glad people study it. It's not that important to me. Because I find something helpful in the story of the transfiguration. And I find something helpful, I find something life-giving in the person and the story of Jesus that makes a difference in my life. And, and I don't worry too much about that. But I think it's noteworthy. So what do we take from the story of the Transfiguration? Well, I think it's important to note that this happens... Uh, people will say about, th about th three years into Jesus' ministry. Okay, Jesus' three and a half year ministry. So it won't be very long after this that Jesus is arrested and convicted and crucified. And it, it, this story comes on the heels of Jesus announcing to his disciples that he was going to be taken up to Jerusalem and tried and convicted and killed. And for the disciples, this was a shocker. I mean, this was not what they were expecting out of Jesus. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And what they were expecting him to do right up until the end was they were expecting him to free the Jewish people from Roman oppression and reestablish the Jewish kingdom that had been lost uh, several hundred years before the time of Jesus. This is what they wanted him to do. He was supposed to be a military and political leader that would reestablish the Jewish kingdom. And Jesus announcing them to them that he was going to die in Matthew chapter 16, Peter says to him, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus is like, Get behind me, Satan. That's what he says to Peter. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. It's interesting. I mean, the the disciples' faith at this point was at least tenuous. I mean, it was on shaky ground. Jesus had just told them that he was going to die. Their whole expectation of who Jesus was and what he was to do was rocked. And it wouldn't be very long before they would go through what you could call the dark night of the soul. Right? When Jesus was arrested and taken away, and all of them, fearing for their lives, fled. They abandoned him. I mean, Peter, we, he, he gets a reputation for denying Jesus, but he hung on longer than all the rest did and followed Jesus for a while. Eventually, he denied him too. They all would go through the dark night of the soul, questioning whether or not Jesus was who they had believed him to be. And maybe the point of the transfiguration was Jesus bringing them up there and saying, look, I know your faith is shaky. I know you're not sure about some of these things, but let me give you a little peek behind the curtain. There's more going on than you realize. And when you get to the dark night of the soul, remember this. Hold on to this moment that you didn't really understand, but that demonstrated to you 
that I am who I say I am. And for me, that's helpful. Because I think we all go through the dark night of the soul. We all have times when our faith is tenuous or on shaky ground. And we want something to hold on to. We want to peek behind the curtain to say there's more going on than we understand. This past week, I think it was this past week, it might have been the previous Friday, I was kind of discouraged about a few things. I mean, just a, a number of things I could uh, uh, tell you about that were just kind of, uh, I was just feeling like this. And Chandra said to me at one point on that particular day, she was like, I mean, what, what's the deal? What's going on, you know? And I was like, as I thought about all these things that were kind of discouraging for me and tried to sum up what is it that I'm wrestling with, you know, I said to her, uh, without any tongue-in-cheek, I said to her, I mean, there's just a number of things, but I guess if you boil it all down, just today I'm not sure that God exists. And one of those things uh, was uh, Chandra has a high school friend that she has kept in touch with that ended up moving to Texas while we were there, and Chandra's kind of kept in touch with her. And her sister just passed away um, from a tumor. I mean, it was so quick and all of this. Uh, Courtney was her name, and, and it kind of got to a point where Susie, this friend of Chandra's, uh, as she was succumbing to the tumor or whatever Courtney was, Susie said, it's, it's not my sister anymore. You know what I mean? I mean, she, the effects of the tumor on her brain and all of this. And that left me thinking, I mean, if it's not her, well, then who is she? Right? It, it, who am I? I mean, if the effects of something in the world now cause me to, it's no longer me, it's no longer her, right? Then... Who am I? Who are we? And I just got thinking about that. So that night uh, before bed, Sean and I prayed, as we have before, not that God would solve or remove all of these things that we were wrestling with or I was wrestling with, but just that he would remind us that he was with us. That has been significant in my life. Just, Just the reminder somehow that that God is, is with us, that he would give us a peek behind the curtain. And I was reminded, I, I carry this notebook around. I write to-do lists in it usually. This, Chandra gave this to me for my birthday a few years ago. Uh, but the very first thing in it, the first two pages, is a, a list of encouraging moments. A list over the past three years of times that we felt like God just reminded us that he was with us. And I counted them up there the other day. There's, there's 29 things in there. And that, that uh, some of which were just really significant for me or really significant for Chandra. And I don't know, but there's a correlation for me in my life of the times that I pray that God would just remind me that he's with me and something happening in my life that does, you know. And then there's been a a few times in my life where I feel like I've gotten a peek behind the curtain of something that that has happened. And uh, I want to tell you about one of those. I don't think I've told you the story. I couldn't remember. I said to Sean, have I told them this story? If I I have, forgive me. uh, If I can't remember telling it, hopefully you don't remember it. But it was was a significant moment for me. I, I directed the choir at our church in Texas for about a year and a half when I... Got there, and we had a, I mean, it was, it was good, it was okay, you know, I'm not a choir director, I'm a fake musician, but it, it, it was, we, it was good. And, but then I got to a point where I thought, I need to recruit some more people to participate in the choir. For the size of church that we are, we ought to have more people in the choir, and yada, yada. So, I changed the rehearsal schedule around, I said, look, come, we're going to rehearse two times on one song that we're going to sing on the next Sunday. So all you have to do is come to two rehearsals, and then we're going to sing. 
And we sang this particular song that goes, uh, when I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me up with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the other most. It makes me want to shout, hallelujah, Lord, you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. And that was this song. And it's kind of this, it's a slow song that plods along and then kind of to a, to a big finish. Um, and it's a, it was a great song. But we sang that song on this particular Sunday. And it happened to be significant for a couple reasons. There was a guy in attendance that was significant for me in uh, a few different ways. There were some other people that were not part of our church that were uh, unbelievers or whatever. And so it was a significant Sunday. So we sang this song uh, and people responded with a prolonged standing ovation. And uh, the pastor got up afterwards and he was like, man, I mean, that's having church, right? And usually we'd, uh, we'd, we sang while the offering plate was being passed, right? And our youth pastor, he was sitting up near the front and the pastor was like, that's having church. And the youth pastor was like, pass it again, pass it again, right? <laughs> uh, and then the next day I got an email from somebody who, for them, that style of music is not their thing, right? And... Uh, but they said, when you sang that song, or my spirit soared, right? And, and then this, this one unbeliever who was there who visited with the pastor the next day, he was like, whatever that choir is, you got to bottle that up, he says. And uh, you cannot convince me that that was anything other than the intervention of God. I mean, I listened to the recording of it a few days later. It wasn't that good. I mean, musically, you know, and, and I, I, the only reason it was good is because God wanted it to be good. I have no better explanation. And for me, it was a peek behind the curtain. It was something I hold on to, you know, in times that are, that are dark, something that I remember. And I don't know what's going on in your life or the moments that are, that are the dark nights of the soul for you. Uh, but I think the saying is helpful. Somebody has said, don't doubt in the dark what God has shown you in the light. Right? Don't doubt in the dark what God has shown you in the light. And I think for the disciples, right, it was it's particularly Easter would have been a difficult time, right? Nobody, none of them expected Jesus to to be arrested and be crucified and all of this. And undoubtedly, they went through this dark night of the soul. But don't forget what God has shown you. Don't forget what is to come. The uh, Tony Campolo, I've mentioned him, I think, a time or two. He, he was a, he is a minister and a teacher and a, evangelist and all these things, and he would speak, and he's written a number of books, but he's well known for uh, a saying, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And he tells the story of, he says, he attended an African-American church in Philadelphia, and he says, and once a year we would have a, a preach-off, he says, where we'd have a number of preachers preach back-to-back -back just to see who's best. He said, we wouldn't say that. And we say it's for the glory of God, right? But, but really, this is what we're doing. You can find him telling this story on YouTube. It's a great deal. He said, so I, I went up, he said, and I was pretty good, you know. But then I sat back down and I said to my, uh, my pastor said to me, you did all right. And he said, Tony said, oh, I said to him, well, are you going to be able to top that? And he was like, sit back, son. And he said, he went up there and for the next half hour, he blew me away with one phrase. He started in low gear. He said, it's Friday. Friday, Jesus was dead in the grave. But that's because it was Friday. Sunday's coming. Friday, people said that things are the way they are, that they cannot change. But I'm telling you, the good news is it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. Friday, they said that a group of people gathered together could not 
go out to impact their community in the world with the love of God, but I'm here to tell you it's only Friday. Sunday's coming, right? <laughs> Tony said he went on like that for an hour. At the end of it, I was exhausted. Right. <laughs> but it's a good reminder. In the dark night of the soul, hold on to the moments where you've gotten a peek behind the curtain. Pray that God would remind you that he's with you. Hold on to what is coming. The celebration of God's victory over sin and over death. So, let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for the reminder at Easter of what you have done for us. Lord, that even in the dark times of life, that we hold on to the knowledge that you have won victory over sin and over death. And, and Lord, we pray that you would remind us of that as we need it from time to time. A reminder again that you are with us. A reminder again that there's more going on than we understand. And I pray that that would give us hope and courage to carry on. So thank you for this story um, and its encouragement to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.